Good morning, church. Let me tell you, <laughs> I'm, I am I am hungry to spend time with you and to um, dig into God's Word together. I've been super encouraged by hearing the stories and getting texts and 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 getting updates from people, calling other people. It's been it's been pretty pretty outstanding. Um, you can turn your Bible to John 18. Uh, as we look at all of this today, I, I can't emphasize it enough. I know I don't have forever to just share, uh, and and we we just want to find ways to talk. Um, but but the Lord is going to open up doors for you to share His Word, to send His His good news out in so many ways. Um, I was on the phone with AT and T on hold with customer service the other day, and when I was done, I, I just felt like Lord. You want me to ask this person how, how they're doing, how I can pray for them. And, and, and let me tell you what, it opened up a doorway to um, a, a time of, of sharing and encouragement. Um, it, it started off with, how can I pray for you? And then this person, I won't tell you the details of our conversation, told me about what's going on. They're personal and, and some spiritual things they're struggling with. And, and, and let me tell you what, there's a truth the world needs to know. And, and it's not that you and I are just here to build facilities. Lord have mercy, facilities mean nothing right now. But they need to know that you and I love them with the love of Jesus Christ. That's, that's why we care for them, because Jesus cares for them. And so you may have a flaky internet service, and you have to call somebody. The Lord may open up a door that you've never walked through. I've talked to more friends saying, I have more opportunities to pray with people and share Jesus Christ than I've ever had at work because of what's going on in this world in this season right now. And so I want you to be aware of that, to know that, that we're, we're in this together. And, and, and the truth is that as we look into John chapter 18, it, it pairs really well uh, with John, uh, with the triumphal entry and Jesus coming into town. When Jesus comes into town riding on a colt on Palm Sunday, he is greeted by, by crowds of people laying down these palm branches, celebrating his coming into town. They, they half know who he is. Many of them caught up in the moment. Some of them heard of his reputation. And he's coming in and they're declaring something. Well, as they're declaring, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, glory to God. As they're, as they're sharing that word of encouragement, they're proclaiming something. And Judas, one of the disciples that was with him that day, finds himself in the garden here in, in chapter 18, towards the end of the week. And he discovers the truth that the people were declaring, this greatness of God. And so in the midst of that, I, I want to I walk with you for a moment. I am an assessor. You can ask any of my friends, any of those people, any people I love with. When I walk into a situation, whether it's personal and, and private or whether it's a room in chaos, I, I tend to just survey the room and see what's going on and, and try to understand it, try to figure out what's going on. It doesn't mean I always respond well, but, I, but I'm always trying to understand it. I want to get a read on it. And, and right now in this season of life, I, I can see myself doing the same thing with what's going on on with with the the virus that's going on or what's going on with our economy or families or different things and and I, I i see other people doing the same thing trying to get a read so i can get a basic knowledge some kind of understanding of what's going on so that i can then make educated or informed decisions right get a read make an informed decision and and here's what i'm learning is becoming a greater greater temptation is to trust my read and believe that my read must absolutely be found in the shadow of jesus christ otherwise i wouldn't have understood the circumstance that way have you been have you been in that moment have you have you found yourself in that in that spot in that in that place well, today, that's where we're going to see Judas. And we have a, a choice today. As we follow the story of this interaction between Judas and Jesus, the soldiers and Jesus, here's the question I want you to be considering and thinking about. Do you trust more in the complexity you can see or the simple truth that you know and believe? Which one are you leaning into today? John chapter 18, verse 1. Check it out with me. The Bible says this way. 
when Jesus had spoken these words, right? We, we just finished talking about that prayer. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. I want you to pause just a second in this point. Uh, Christy and I were blessed years ago to be able to go to Jerusalem, and we've talked about it before. And, and in that, we found ourselves in this garden, in the, in the Kidron Valley, in this, in this brook area that the Bible's describing. And, and it's an amazing spot. The, the city of Jerusalem, old Jerusalem and the newer part, it is busy, it is loud, there's always life going on. It's this crazy thing. But in this garden, in the middle of it all, it's peaceful. It, it's, it's like there's a, a hush. And so I want, I want you to do something with me in this season of of bringing in data and looking things up. I want you to know that God has given you your heart and your mind and your imagination so that you can savor and dwell on Him and who He is. And so would you do this with me? Would you just close your eyes and, and try to imagine where Jesus and His disciples were that night as we get going? If you have children around your husband or wife, why don't you grab their hand? And just for a moment, like you're standing there together, close your eyes. Because where you are is sitting in a really a rocky valley. And, and it's that there's just a thin layer of grass at your feet. It's not much for cushion, but it's something. But, but dirt past line at all. You are surrounded by giant olive trees. And olive trees don't have thick branches, they uh, thick leaves. They just have these little, little leaves, thousands of them. It just looks like limbs can be seen, and all the details of these trees are right there together, and it's nighttime. Y you can pick your chin up just a little bit to the left, and, and it feels like it's right on top of you. There's the wall to Jerusalem. And just to your left is the Temple Mount. You see, you could see the garden from the temple and the temple from the garden as if there was some type of connection between the peace where Christ was and the peace that his father had brought with his presence. And then on that night, you see a line of torches and fires coming down in the distance, hundreds of yards away, knowing that something's on the move. And you realize it's coming your way. Right here in this moment, do you cling to the peace or are you pulled to the shallow complexity heading your way? Father God, we give you this moment. Lord, draw us into where you are. Lord, I know right now there are homes and relationships and families and lives where, Lord, there is there is war. There is a, a line of torches coming in. And fear is, is wooing us to this complex situation that needs and calls or demands of us a complex answer that, that muddies the water. But Father God, I pray today that we would find ourselves remaining by you, behind you in the garden. Lord, come what may, regardless of what we might be drawn to or how to react, that we might find ourselves behind you and with you, knowing there is no other place to be. Lord, you are not carrying weapons with you because you are. Lord, you are not, you are not at war. You are not trembling because you are. So, Father, would you let the peace of the garden rest upon us right now? as the stirring of your victory still stirs and moves in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, just for fun, you can now play this game of how, how did what you imagine look to how, what it looks like today. So check out this picture uh, for you. It's going to pop up on your screen. This was just over the valley. The valley that Jesus was sitting in was this close. There's the wall. There's the temple mount. Now, as that comes down, come back to me. As that comes down, move back in with me. Because today, as we celebrate, I, I want you to know we're going to tear it apart. We're going to look at the difference between this war, this, this com complexity that looks so 
beautiful, that, that woos us in so much versus the simplicity of the Almighty in Jesus Christ. And by the end of the day, the question will remain, where do you stand? Where will you find your, your, your lifeline? And what good will it be? John chapter 18, verse 2. Follow it. Come on. The Bible says this. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. Verse 3. And Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went with lanterns and torches and weapons. Now, now pause. Check it out. Look up. Follow me on this. In, in, in verse 2, we see the Bible says that Judas had some knowledge. He, he knew the place where Jesus would be. He, he had a glimmer of truth. He had a glimmer of hope. And this glimmer of knowledge was enough to amass a following of hundreds that came out with him. The Bible tells us that, that Roman soldiers, a cohort, 300 plus men, came out with him. The Bible tells us that, that the chief priests, that they sent their guards with him and officers with him out from them. And then the Bible tells us that Pharisees joined him, the, the legal, the judicial, the executing, the ex executive branch, all of that. Judas brought all of them with him. They all believed, based on a little bit of knowledge, a, a, a shallow assessment of what was going on, that this guy was worth following that this guy was worth believing, that this guy was worth trusting. But church, this morning, all Judas had was a shallow knowledge. That's all he had. How do I know that? Well, first of all, Scripture tells us he just knows the place. But look what he surrounded himself with. When you're afraid, when you're concerned, do you do what I do? Do you start planning out 407 different backup plans? Do you try to cover all of your bases? Have you ever heard that, that saying, don't put all of your eggs in one basket and so you spread it out? Look what Judas did. If Judas had full knowledge and he knew that that night he was going to go and he was going to take command of the situation and he was in control, why do you need so many people? If you're afraid of a battle, you bring the Romans. It, if you're afraid of, of a following, a respect of, of the, the system and the chief priests of Judaism, you, you bring his officers. If you're, if you're anxious and not 100% sure if they're going to bring up some legal argument, you bring the Pharisees. You see, Judas, it, he revealed his complex shallowness in who he surrounded himself with. Church, we're going to see the folly and the fault in this moment. But right now, here's what I'm letting you know. I am tempted daily to pretend that my, my shallow knowledge is sufficient for others to follow and I can make a decent enough plan to get us through this to make sure all of our bases are covered just in case something goes wrong. Are you there? I was, I was up here last night. Yesterday was an amazing day for me. Um, I'm aware of church members losing their jobs and, and other church members seeing what's happening in their economy. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of what's happening in, 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 in some homes and with children and the frustrations and, and things that are going up. And I, I'm just praying and saying, Lord, what do we do? I'm trying to figure out all the solutions. How can, how can we help? What does that look like? And you know what's funny? I'm asking God, how can I help? What can we do? But I'm not even giving him time to listen. I, I'm, I'm before he could even think to speak, so to speak, before he would get an Edward, uh, an Ed, a word in edgewise. I'm thinking of, of possibilities. I'm thinking of what's going on. And, and I'm thinking, Lord, how do we help provide when there's no tank to provide from? And just then, I, I'm coming in from my run and I, I see this bag on the front porch and some confetti and things like that. And I know that in this moment, when I'm even thinking of our household, how do we pull back just a little bit to be ready to be good stewards? Lord, how do I, how do I encourage? But the Lord has already answered. He's already provided and I didn't have to do anything. You see, in my complexity, I am seeking solutions and framing it in a prayer to the Lord. Have you been there with me? Have you found yourself there trying to, to put up a front for your family right now? Drop it. 
I came up here last night working on a, on a thing with our smart board and some, some, some issues that were going on. And about 7.10, I was done. I'd been working all day to figure out solutions. And in that moment, I, I was really tempted to go through service one more time to make sure every T was crossed, every I was dotted. But the Lord said, worship me. So I put my earphone in my ear and music played. And I worshiped the Lord and prayed over you for a half hour. Why? Because the Lord's word became more and more real to me in the moment. That the shallow complexities of your plan are insufficient. But the simplicity of who I am is all sufficient. Right now, if your husband needs to receive that, would you just lean into him? If your wife needs that message right now, would you just draw her near? The Lord is faithful, and he is not needing your complexity. He's wooing you, not to frame your thinking in prayer, but to come to him for truth. You see, Judas frames it in. Go a little bit further. We're now in verse 4. The Bible says this. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him. Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him. He came forward and he said to them, who do you seek? You see, do you see the difference between Jesus and Judas? Judas. Judas knew the place, and Jesus knew it all. Judas, Judas knew the, the color of Jesus' hair. Jesus knew every hair on Judas' head. Judas, Judas knew how, how he thought the night could play itself out. Jesus knew Judas' heart when he was still in his mother's womb. Judas believed that the night would be his covering and Jesus knew wherever the sun is, there are no shadows because darkness cannot overcome it. Do you see the difference? Do you feel his peace? He says, whom do you seek? In that moment... The Bible says when Jesus, when they said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth, he said, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. Verse 6, and when he said to them, I am, he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Do you see it? The power in the name of Jesus, simple. Jesus doesn't say, pull out your swords. He doesn't say, let's go, you want to bring it out? Let me call some angels up. He, he doesn't say, you have fallen into my elaborate scheme. He doesn't do this. Jesus is consistent today, yesterday, and forever. He is the same. How do I know? Because when Moses was going to be God's vessel to set the people free, he said, whom, whom will I say that sent me? He said, I am. He said, I am. When we, when we look into to the New Testament in Jesus Christ, he, his message was the same. Do you want to know where the depth of life is? I am. John chapter 11. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Do you, do you know that when Jesus saw the woman at the well, and, and she's, she's saying, who are you? Are you greater? We're waiting for the one who to, who's to come. He says, I am. I am the one. I am the bread of life who will meet your needs. I am the, the living water whom you'll never thirst again for. I am. Church, do you realize the power and the fullness and the potency in that statement? Saul in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 13, he, he tries to do it all on his own. He brings everybody to war. Samuel, seven days past what Saul wanted. And so Saul in that moment saw the people scattering, came up with his own plan. 
And he says, give me the sacrifice. I will stand in the place of God's man. And I will offer. Samuel comes up and says, what have you done? Church, you are not I am, but he is. So will you find yourself impacted by his power by watching your plans explode or will you find yourself guarded by his power because you stand behind him and he goes before you after they stumble and fall verse 7 says this so he asked them again whom do you seek they said Jesus of Nazareth Jesus said I told you I am he if you seek me, let these men go. You see, Jesus exposes who's really the authority in this moment. The best laid plans, the best, the best angle on everything. Jesus says, no, who do you really seek? What are you really after, Judas? What are you really after, Pharisees? What are you really after, Romans? What are you really after? I hear you saying Jesus of Nazareth, but when I told you who I was, you backed off. You see, if you were really after me, you would find me. Why? Because Jesus says, if you seek me, you will find me. Jesus, he's been drawing, he's been calling men to his reputation. He's been wooing us to him. Church, this morning, Jesus wants to know, who do you seek to be the healer of your marriage? Who do you seek to be your sustenance in this time? Who do you seek to be your confidence? Who do you seek? If you say Jesus and recoil back into your own plans, he's asking you again, who do you seek? Because here he is. If you've been struggling with your spirituality, if you've been wrestling with your faith, who do you seek? Jesus says, I am he. So if you seek me, then don't be distracted by everyone else behind me. They're under my protection, they're under my guard. If you, if you really seek me, Put all of your eggs in my basket right here, right now. Do you not know I'm the smartest accountant in the world? Do you not know I'm, I'm the, the best brother? Do you not know that, that you'll find no greater example of a father? Do you not know that no one is more caring and more loving? Do you not know? If, if you really seek me today, here I am. He's not hiding. He's not surprised that you're here right now with him. Because he knows you. He knows your joy this morning and your gratefulness. And he's here. He knows your fear and your pain. And he's here. Judas brought lanterns and weapons and torches. What will you bring down? Do you need to lay it at his feet and say, Jesus, you're right. I'm just here for you. Church, the best place to be is in the simplicity and the power of Jesus, not in the complexity of simple knowledge. Here's what I want you to know. Even when you know who Jesus is, it's easy to find yourself in the wrong spot. Peter did. He was behind Jesus, protected, and then he decided to jump out in front of Jesus and protect him. And Jesus says, what are you doing? Shall I not drink of the cup the Father's given me? Get behind me. If you've jumped out in front of Jesus this morning, get behind him. If you've never knelt at the feet of I am, kneel in front of him. Father God, we love you. You are. You are. Lord, would you let your simplicity blow away our complexity? Would you allow your authority to overwhelm us in victory? Lord Jesus, if there is anyone watching today, 
that has not surrendered to I am. Lord, this morning, would they surrender? Father God, would they can reach out to us or another believer that they know loves you, God. Would you let us to surrender? Lord, let us, let us taste and see how good you are in the simplicity of Christ. We love you, Jesus, in your name.